hello everyone um, and welcome to our little pre presentation about our game or about our game's technology to be precise. Uh, you pr might have heard some hype about our game and if you've heard about it um, you're probably guessing that most of the technical stuff or the, really the most important technical stuff is uh, regards to procedural rendering. So um, in, in this session, I'm going to introduce you into some of our methods on uh, how we uh, generate uh, meshes to the Unity to render um, from a voxel terrain to, to, a, to a mesh to render. So um, this is going to be a pretty technical session, but uh, I, I, I'm really tried to try to make it a little bit more accessible, so even even designers and artists could get something out of it, or at least like get some ideas on, on um, uh, what what is possible to do with Unity. So when you when you really reach the limits in Unity. So, um, but at first, um, let me introduce ourselves. Uh, we are a grant crew, which is a, a company we founded a couple of years ago, and. Um, our uh, super villain hideout is in Helsinki, Finland, where many of the coolest gaming companies are actually from. And during these few years, we've already grown to 20 employees. And we are still working on our debut game, Supernotes. But overall, as a company, uh, we really want to innovate the old patterns. And, and Especially with the supernauts, we are really want to encourage people to be creative and 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 have as good um, uh, experience as possible. So um, so instead of just milking money from the customers, we really um, want people to pay voluntarily. For example, in the free to pay play business model. And and while we're at it, we want to have as much as fun as possible as a company as well. So I hopefully it really really shows in our games and and in this pre presentation and everything. So yeah. Um, here's us uh, as of 2012 summer, I think. Um, it's the picture is taken at our cool rooftop terrace at our office. Uh, that's me, and I, I've been involved with the company almost from the very beginning. And I have, I have uh, many years of professional experience in gaming industry, and, and my main interests are usually been have been in algorithms and graphics technology and and all that technology stuff. Um, I also have to give a uh, special credit to Jarno Wolioki, who is our kind of math wizard. And lo lots, of, lots of our um, uh, hardcore mathematics behind, behind some of these techniques are, are from him. But anyways, um, Supernauts, the reason I'm here now, is uh, the game we're making, as I said, it's powered by Unity. And we actually upgraded to version 4 just like a month ago or something like that, and we were really impressed with it, especially with the mechanism. It's really cool. And it, it just really, really um, enabled us to focus on the, what's really essential things to do. And, and like we can keep, give all the basic stuff to be handled uh, by Unity. So, so, so it's been really efficient. Um, so the Supernauts has been under uh, development from since almost from the very beginning, and and we've really really put lots of effort into it that we can bring something uh, new and revolutionizing to people, and and we've been really happy with the results so far. Um, just a couple of words about the architecture. Um, we have programmed the game with C sharp, and and. We also have server-side backend, uh, which is also programmed in the C Sharp, and we have uh, one shared code base that uh, the, both the client, so the Unity side and, and the server side uses. And then we have some client-specific code and server-specific code. Most of the uh, client-specific codes are mono behaviors and, and such stuff. So. Um, Supernauts, among other things, it's it's about uh, building your own worlds from blocks. That's kind of the central uh, element in our game, and um, and it's it's kind of like I had some innovation from Minecraft, but not even close to because we have like lots of other other aspects in our games, like social aspects and 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 like you can visit your other places, your your friends' places, you can share your creations, and uh, you can complete missions, you can solve puzzles in our game. Uh, and, and, and that kinds of stuff. 
Um, but uh, obviously, it's probably not very hard to see um, why the procedural graphics generation technology is, is really essential for our game. So, um, uh, so that's what we are focusing into. Um, we've actually used huge amount of time in designing the algorithms we've used with, with the artists. So, um, so instead of doing some technology jerking for no reason, we want to um, um, make the artist's vision come into reality. So, so that's, that's like the main, has been the main priority for us. <laughs> and, and that way the game doesn't look like, like really that empty. It has like more soul. So it, it, it's, it's, and, and that, that's what we are being like trying to do here. So uh, let's break our technical challenges down then. So almost everything, as I said before here, it's they rendered with voxels, or they're like voxels that are triangulated. Well, obviously there's a couple of exceptions, like those objects, coins over there, and, and, and that kinds of stuff. But basically all the um, environments, they're, they're like made from the blocks. And, and, and since we're uh, developing for mobile, um, optimizations are essentially very, very important. So, um, so that's why it's, it's really one of the top priorities. We have, we have to constantly look into profile, profiler data all the time, so, so we can have the um, optimal, per, uh, as good performance as possible all the time. And recording optimizations, it could, could be breaking into a couple of things. And um, first of all, it is the initial generation of the whole terrain or the geometry here and also the updating of the geometry here, because uh, players are, are all the time building new stuff here, and, and we, we have to make the uh, gaming experience as fluid as possible. So, so it's been really, really um, interesting challenge to overcome. Um, also, anyone who has developed for mobile uh, or, or anything knows that draw calls are really important to keep in low. And, um, and uh, that's actually the case almost always when, when you're rendering with GPU and have a slower CPU. So you want to keep communication between the CPU and GPU as low as possible. And the draw calls are like instructions from CPU to GPU and basically do stuff. So we want to do as much po as possible with a uh, minimum amount of information um, transferred between those two units. Um, I uh, actually don't, don't really have that much time into going into draw call optimizations regarding our terrain, but I just, just said that it's it's really, really important thing to do. And um, uh, Unity has pretty cool good tools to profile it. The profiler shows you how many draw calls the Unity engine is actually doing. So you might want to have a look at that. And um, it's also possible to take the OpenGL ES dump with the Xcode. So you get pretty detailed breakdown actually what the Unity is doing there. Um, one really important thing, obviously, is then to optimize shaders, um, and that, that's that's purely GPU side. So uh, if if you just have limited limited GPU, such as especially for example iPad 3, uh, it has kind of uh, uh, about as efficient GPU as iPad 2, but uh, four times the pixels. So obviously the pixel shaders are going to be uh, uh, on lots of strain. <coughs> um, but uh, enough about that. Uh, while we want to uh, keep everything optimized, we obviously want everything to look good. So um, we've um, did some a couple of trickery here and 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 applied some techniques to make 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 it look like really modern and and, and nice looking, like in in the picture. And one thing I'm going to focus a little bit more today is the ambient occlusion we've implemented. Um, but I'm, I'm going to tell you more about that later. Um, then there's the, some detailed decoration system, our, um, uh, which is kind of integrated into the tessellator system. And, and, and otherwise, that is configurable by, by the artists. Uh, with which they can generate all kinds of, create all kinds of details and, and small features to the uh, levels that are automatically generated. So, um, so uh, that kind of makes the last, last touch to the, to the whole, whole scenery. So um, let's go on to our uh, first challenge, which is going to be the 
actual geometry here. So the, this is kind of the fundamental algorithm for our game, and, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of going into a little bit of detail how we've, we've made it as, as, as efficient as possible. Um, so um, the first step here is, so we have some kind of just some blocks here, and the server just gives it to the client, and the client needs to just uh, start tessellating as fast as possible and start st showing it to the player. So, so he doesn't have to wait too much. So, um, what we are interested in in the, in the first step of our algorithm is the outer surface, because uh, obviously you wouldn't do anything about the blocks inside because they're not visible, right? So, so that's what we're going to track first. And one thing we've um, applied a really lot in really very many places, but is to use um, bitmaps. And like, I mean, literary bitmaps, uh, as in series of ones and zeros. Those are really uh, efficient and fast to operate on um, with the um, current CPUs, because you can do all the bitwise operations, and with shifting and a little bit, uh, all that, you can do lots of cool stuff, basically. So um, what we do here, we just um, pack the whole thing into a bitmap and start operating on that. So uh, let's look first how we get our uh, surface vertices out here. So um, uh, let's just interpret this bitmap a little differently. So let's think that all the um, cell, cell in the bitmap uh, represents the corner of the block, like the left, left top backwards block, uh, corner of the block. And um, then we have almost actually almost ready ready uh, representation of all our corners, but we have to uh, do some little little bit more. So what we do now is uh, we shift the bitmap uh, uh, one unit into each dimensions, and um, and then or it together. So that's how we get actual um, a complete bitmap for all the uh, all the corners in our scenery. But uh, this is not yet the complete um, representation we are wanting, because we want to uh, filter all the corners inside the terrain out. And again, uh, because we have everything packed in these uh, bitmasks, it's, it would, it's um, easy to just, just um, use, again, bitwise operations. So they come in handy again. So this time, um, we filter them out by um, uh, doing an AND operation with the original block bitmap. So the basic idea is that when a corner, uh, all the blocks that touch a corner are solid, then it is inside a terrain. So we kind of uh, shift the block map in each direction and then AND them together, so we get all the inner blocks, and then we just uh, operate it with the uh, inner vertices and filter them out, so that makes them disappear from the final map. So now we have a nice representation of, of um, all the surface vertices, but that's not like complete yet, because we also need the faces. But um, we again use used the same kind of techniques here, but uh, the uh, actual problem here is how are we going to represent our faces with bitmaps? And uh, the solution we came up with was to use uh, three different bitmaps one for each direction. So one bitmap uh, uh, contains all the faces that uh, are facing up and down and, and so forth. So we do that. And after this realization, it's actually super easy to extract the faces. And it goes basically just like this. We just uh, XOR the block map, shift it into according direction, and, and we automatically just get the faces out. So that's how um, we get our uh, intermediate data structure here. And this, uh, this, this could be implemented in lots of many ways, but while we're using bitmaps, actually, there's a couple of reasons. For example, you can um, cache, uh, uh, if you have a bigger area, you can cache some of the smaller areas like ready. And if you already need to tessellate some parts of the area again, you and if the area hasn't changed, you don't need to do that anymore again. So that's kind of a really big speed up for our um, update algorithms. 
Um, but anyways, we cannot render this actually yet, so be, because we actually need the mesh. So what we um, continue forward on gathering the, all the vertices and faces from these bitmaps bitmaps into a list which we can pass to the Unity's mesh later on. <coughs> and um, um, this actually becomes a little bit more complicated than one would actually originally think, because we have different smoothing groups, and we have like some smooth substances, and then we might have some hard substance like in, um, near near it. So we need to duplicate some vertices because they might have different normals. So we don't really know very easily the, our um, eventual vertex count even yet at this point. So what our algorithm does, um, it's probably not the most most um, most uh, effective solution yet because it could be, for example, made with GPU much more efficiently. But but um, we kind of uh, generate one big vertex list first that has gaps, and that's that's because we can directly map. Uh, all the vertices with, uh, regarding the smoothing groups with just a formula to their index. And that makes also generating the faces really easy, because when we're just now iterating our face map, we can, we can just directly compute uh, where our vertices will be, or what the indexes of the faces will, uh, vertices will be. So um, after this, this, this step, we kind of have a uh, mesh ready already, but um, it's it's not really really enough yet, so we we need to pack pack all the gaps away and and remap the face indexes away. But but that's basically how we finally get the final uh, vertex list. And at this point, uh, we could are actually are already pass this data to the Unity mesh renderer, but um, it would look pretty much like Minecraft. So we want to um, modify the vertices a little bit so they look smooth and, 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 and otherwise, otherwise good. So I have a couple of words how we then smoothen our vertices. Uh, this is going to be a little bit messy, but try to bear with me. This is uh, lots of theory here. But um, basically, Catmull Clark is the industry standard method in uh, smoothing all the uh, meshes. But um, obviously, we cannot really apply that very well into real time, especially because we are uh, operating on mobile. We have to make things work fast with the mobile. So. Um, we cannot afford subdivision because, for example, if you would apply a uh, Catmull Clark two times into a mesh, the polygon count would increase 16 fold. So that's kind of obviously way, way too much for any, any uh, sensible implementation. <clears throat> so um, we skip the subdivision part and start just directly um, offset our vertices. But we also we've also modified the original Catmull Clark, Clark formula here. And um, just a quick word: the P is the original vertex, the F is the face midpoint average, the R is the edge midpoint average, the N is the neighboring edges. Just you follow me. Um, but we can mathematically simplify this because uh, our rectangles are parallelograms. So we kind of kind of uh, can exploit all the symmetries in the topology and everything. For example, here's one one realization that the face midpoints are are kind of like um, you can uh, write this kind of relation with uh, vertex midpoints and face midpoints. And 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 with that, if we just insert uh, and play along with the formulas a little bit. We will have a little bit nicer, or not not yet very much nicer, but a little bit different formula. And uh, it turns out that you can uh, also replace then the face midpoints with the um, um, vertex midpoints, uh, which will make our um, formula look much more pretty. So basically, we don't need to uh, do anything with the edge midpoints, and and it's like in low at lower level, it's it's much more simple. Um, also, we notice that now that what we are actually doing here is, is that we are just offsetting the vertex with some certain amount. So let we add um, add a 
notice that we can add a parameter there, smoothness, S, and that S will just, just scale that offset with certain amount. So that's our final offsetting formula we are using. And uh, what's interesting about this ma um, magic number S is that it actually can be negative as well. So if you give negative values to it, it will uh, create kind of uh, interesting looking, looking um, edgy, edgy uh, behavior. In, in a, so it, it's, it's been really um, useful, especially when we've been looking for kind of cartoony look and, and stuff like that. It kind of exaggerates all the angles. So it's, it's been quite quite cool realization, and I've come really, really uh, handy. So then what we just do, we just uh, iterate a couple of times that formula, and and that's about it. I also put those uh, explanations there just in case someone wants these slides afterwards. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. it but uh, there's still one little uh, problem with this algorithm we need to come by, and, and I'll just go this quickly. But um, the, the uh, basic idea is that when, when Catmull Clark, when you start with a box and you uh, repeat Catmull Clark with it, it should converge to a sphere. But uh, when we skip the subdivision part and we just fake the whole thing, then uh, it actually converges to a small point. Some, some feature features will get disappeared. So we've come up with some um, mathematical trickery here, and, and we just um, want to retain the volume as the same as it was before the smoothing. And, and what we just basically do, we uh, kind of push the vertices along the uh, face normals and, and use some kind of um, heuristics that if, if the uh, angle is really sharp, then, then uh, weight that a little bit more and, and everything. But, but just to mention that, that if you try to implement it, it this will occur and, and you, you have to come up, up with some kind of solution here. <coughs> All right, but uh, enough about this already. So uh, we'll go to our next challenge already, and, and that's our um, ambient occlusion algorithm here. And um, it's the ambient occlusion actually. It's 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 quite um, widely used in modern console games nowadays, at least. It's been around like like. Um, I don't know, at least for seven years when someone figured out, out that you can compute it in the screen space as a post-processing. So suddenly every, every game started using, using that, uh, at least at the console world. Um, and, and, and just mention that the Unity also has the, the screen space ambient occlusion implemented. So you can just directly use it, especially if, if you're uh, targeting to, to a PC or, um, or uh, console games or other high-end devices. But anyways, um, we cannot afford the screen space solution. We can't really do any any um, any um, post processing because we have quite limited limited amount of performance here. So um, okay, and just to make clear, um, this is kind of the component, the ambient occlusion component. So it gives gives kind of good impression of the the um, global illumination kind of look. And um, let's have a quick. Um, overview what the ambient occlusion actually is for those of you who, who aren't really familiar with it. So uh, this is basically the ambient occlusion. It's, it's a scary mathematical looking formula. It's, it's stolen from Wikipedia and everything, so you don't actually don't have to mind it. But the idea itself isn't really that scary at all. So if, if we just imagine we have our surface here with normal, and then we have our point, point here which we want to shade. Uh, we then kind of um, imagine the infinitesimally small uh, hemisphere around it, and um, and uh, then we um, just um, figure out kind of how much this um, all the ob obstructing geometry around kind of blocks the view from the sphere. And that's what basically this formula says. Uh, and one other, another thing it actually says uh, as well is that um, uh, the, the occluding geometry that points more into the uh, terrain normal will be wasted more than the one that are fa not that much facing there. And then you just add, add all that, that effect together and then you get, uh, basically get your ambient occlusion. 
Um, so let's get into our uh, approximation here. Uh, as told before, we just compute it in, in the, um, just in per vertex um, manner, and, and because we are, we are anyways, we are um, constructing our meshes. It, it's 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 fine if we just do a little bit of extra compute while we're at it. So it's it's not really that doesn't cause that many much extra overhead anyway. So um, what we do here here is the let's just imagine that's the corner we are now want to shade, and. Um, what our algorithm does, it iterates all the touching corners nearby the vertex here. And, um, and uh, we kind of uh, uh, imagine that these little points around the corners are like infinitesimally close to the uh, vertex here, but only with, with that difference that it is actually in the surface. It's normal, it's facing to the surface direction. Uh, and, um, and 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 let's 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 have a look. And then we just um, actually average the, the results from all those corners uh, into the vertex, and we get our uh, nice result, which is kind of kind of pretty close to that. And uh, let's have a closer closer look to the one of the corners we are um, estimating here. So uh, what the basic idea in the algorithm is, is goes like this, that um, we go uh, for each corner now, we uh, just have a look on each uh, faces nearby. Uh, our implementation currently looks only the uh, faces that are touching the corner. So, so it, it's, it's surprisingly fast because, the, because uh, we have quite good uh, data structures there. But uh, let's think, for example, we are... Um, computing the occlusion for this phase over there. And um, well, what we want to do um, next is to um, kind of imagine that our um, space is here now uh, to, to the corner direction. So we, um, in our implementation, we actually just um, transform everything to the space of the, or our computations, we transform everything to the space of this hemisphere. But uh, that's just some mathematical stuff, and, and, and you can do that on paper later on. And but anyways, the most important thing is to do: we want to project the face uh, uh, endpoints to the to the surface of the sphere. And and we we are just thinking that the face has as as infinitely long uh, edges there, and uh, our sphere is a unit sphere. Or at least that's what, that's what we do mathematically. Theoretically, the, the, the sphere is infinitesimally small. So, um, anyways, um, after we've done this, we uh, want to um, compute kind of how much this um, this um, phase will occlude our sphere. And what we do here is now that we project the occluding area into the sphere uh, surface. And um, that's that's kind of the similar similar situation as my my previous uh, illustration in the theory. Uh, we we may, may got some corners around there, and it's it's not that important that it's it's exactly the same what it should be. But as long as we're like close enough, it's it's okay. And then we do this kind of mathematical trick that we kind of project that uh, geometry just on the basis plane. And, and that, the reason we are doing this, that it actually kind of uh, makes the, um, it does the wasting of the direction for us automatically. And you can easily kind of imagine that if, if, if a, a point is really close to the, uh, uh, um, to the surface, the area will be quite, quite thin. And if it's going straight upwards, the area is much larger. So, so that's basically basically how we compute the occlusion. And the final occlusion is actually just the surface area of this projection. And um, I really don't have that much time in the code and the implementation details here, but I'll just say that, um, that um, we don't actually actually do any of that uh, projections. We never uh, operate on the area on the surface. We just directly compute the points on the surface, and then we use just some uh, quick formula to to compute the area, and then we just sum all the effect of all the neighboring vertices to this one um, occlusion. 
So um, that's that's around uh, that's about the, our um, idea there, basic basic idea there. So so um, it's it's not really that much of a more more simple uh, complicated. So um, let's go into a little bit more lighter subject now. And here's um, um, this. Um, uh, we've implemented uh, this kind of edge extrusion system, which is configurable by artists. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have some screenshots later on, but um, what we basically just do here is that we have um, just some geometry here, and we have two different substances and everything. And our, our routines just will find the surfaces of like two different substances or, or other good places and extract the edges there. Then we just uh, extrude the edges with, with some certain amount. Our artists have configured them at some point, and uh, and and um, and with with certain angles. So um, so. Um, then we just fill, fill them with, with polygons and, and get our end result there. And the, um, um, the artist has also configured some material which will be used there and everything. So, so that's how we just decorate our terrain. Uh, again, this is actually quite straightforward to implement. So I'm not, not kind of, and, and that kind of depends on your implementation, but the basic idea is this. And the, um, the direction can be quite, quite anything. For example, um, here we have pretty ugly, ugly uh, surface um, or, or the uh, line between the surfaces. It looks really computer uh, rendered, and, and it, it's it's kind of ugly. So um, what we, uh, for example, could do is that it, it generates this kind of um, uh, grass decoration over there, and now it looks much more natural. Like uh, all the all the ugly sharp edges just uh, goes away, and, and everyone's happy. And um, another example here is, the, um, for example, that roof over there. It's, it looks kind of nice already, but uh, we could actually prettify it a little bit more, more if we w would want to do something like this. This is again automatically generated with uh, our artist configuration, and uh, everything works fine. Um, we've also exploited this system to generate kind of different kinds of material. We have one material that is called a balcony, and, and it's uh, again very it is very easy to implement. It's just just another um, another uh, entry in our system, so it it, it ro is, isn't really really that different. But we get get a really really cool new material very easily, and and we can just do uh, with a little bit Im of imagination. We've like got a really huge sets of different kind of substances in our game just by playing a lot around with this system. So so it's been actually pretty pretty cool. Um, another um, really um, basic. Um, basic um, uh, detailing system is just uh, decoration objects. And um, and uh, this is quite simple uh, again. I mean, by, by the idea is really really simple. We just uh, just um, instantiate some objects into the terrain surface, and, and then just rotate it along the surface normal and um, and uh, yeah, like that. And and they can't be like any prefabs created by artists. And again, just like like previously, they can just configure on uh, what kinds of prefabs the system will spawn on which kinds of kinds of substances. And and we can again create lots of different kinds of variations with this. For example, a cactus material. It's it's created with this with this um, this the system just made it possible to uh, spawn all the spikes into the into the cactus. So. That's like one 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 usage example of it, or it it kind of it, it doesn't necessarily even need to be a mesh that you're uh, instantiating there. It can be any anything you can create in a prefab. So for example, here have this uh, plutonium material here, um, which uh, I think there are some kind of particles or something like I don't know. The artists have made them by themselves, so so I just picked up some examples there but 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 these kinds of stuff or or there's something like i don't know this is some smoke material it's kind of you can create clothes into your uh, worlds with this substance but they're they're also spawned with the system so it 
um, with surprisingly simple ideas, you can uh, do lots of very uh, different looking stuff with 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 really um, with with just using a little bit of imagination. So so that's that's pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna have a few words about um, the. Um, the implementation here. Uh, this is actually the screenshot. That we uh, have put the configuration just into a, uh, a script, and, and we have just a, an array, and the, the, the values are stored in prefab. The artists can tweak them as they like. And yeah, as I told you before, you can just uh, configure a prefab, just any prefab, and then there's a density parameter, which is actually um, probability uh, with which the system will spawn the object into the surface. And that probability is interpolated from edges to the closer to the center. So so for example for vegetation it's it's much it looks much more natural that uh, it's, it's much much more, uh, more sparse in the edges and much more dense in the center. So so that's about it. And um one technical aspect um, which is uh, re um, related to the Unity renderer actually is that um, uh, when we have usually the objects have really small vertex count which uh, for the vegetation like the leaf it, it's probably just a couple of polygons or something like that. So um, it usually means that the instance count is really really big and, and, and that obviously will result into uh, huge amounts of amounts of draw calls. Well, okay, uh, Unity has dynamic batching system, but this is where it becomes a little bit flawed, because um, the dynamic batching system in Unity will just look at that. Oh, we have lots of small objects here, and it would not make sense to uh, draw draw them in, in such a, such many uh, draw calls. So I'm going to combine them on the run. But um, the dynamic batching system actually scales pretty badly with really large instance count. So um, what you should do if you're doing uh, stuff like this is to uh, use the uh, static combining for for the for the um, meshes. And um, uh, the, the Unity actually has uh, there's actually a, a method for combining all the meshes meshes with just one call and 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 it, you should actually use that because it's it's very well implemented and it's really efficient to use and we've also used that quite a lot because um well uh we don't we don't really need <coughs> haven't have need to uh, implement this anything of our own because it it has worked pretty efficiently so so that's something i can recommend there so um yeah but anyways, um, I think that's that's all of my material right now here. And um, thank you very much, all of you listening. Uh, this went a little bit faster than I thought, but um, there was actually a really, um, huge amount of stuff uh, still I, I could could have shared with you. And and um, um, you, you, we could have the Q and A session, for example, right now. Or um, if you want to, you can just come and ask me afterwards. I can demo the game as well and um, so forth. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
but on, on the other hand, yeah, there's actually something more. We also have this um, kind of a physics system for our uh, Foxhall terrain, and but it's it's also quite complicated because uh, there's quite an uh, efficient algorithm that separates all the different uh, groups. If, if you uh, remove a block, the system will quickly detect that there's some uh, disconnection in the in the mesh, and, and then it starts tracking it downwards, and, and then like uh, drops all the blocks. So, so that's kind of a, at least some kind of collision we have in the game. Right. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, yep, yeah, there's one. Uh, okay, so the question was, in the game, is everything procedurally generated? Um, no, not actually, because uh, we have uh, some, some uh, static game objects and decorated, decorated objects there, but uh, all the environments, all the, our um, uh, places and worlds, they are procedurally generated. And, um, well, obviously, all the, the decorations, those leaves and everything, they are just like prefabs the artists have made before, so those aren't also procedurally generated. But the, but the terrain, terrain itself, it, it is completely procedurally generated. All our levels are procedurally generated and, and, and everything in that sense. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have many voxels in one scene, and um, we actually, um, when we make our bitmaps, we um, we, are, we separate some. So we have some different tessellation groups sometimes, for example, when because, uh, for example, with transparent materials, you have to generate surface between two materials. So we just generate two distinct cases about about the same materials. But otherwise, when we tessellate it, we we usually just um, Consider everything just being the same material, and, and, and only when we are starting to uh, uh, construct our final mesh, then we just uh, start to uh, separate the materials. So, yeah, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. So, anyone else? Is there, I'm not sure if I see any hands there. This light is a little bit blinding me, but. All right, but um, anyways, uh, feel free to come to talk to me, and, and I, can, I'm, I will, would be really happy happy to show you some some other stuff we've made or or, or demo the game. And um, uh, and uh, also, if if you got interest, go ahead and you try your luck with us as well, and or talk to our CEO Markus Basula is also here and everything. And yeah, but that's about it. Thank you very much.